If someone sends you an email inviting you to change the way the world drinks, I bet there is no way you wouldn't take up that challenge. Our guest did receive that exact email, and three years down the line, she has. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time. Claire Warner, co-founder of Acorn, the non-alcoholic range of aperitifs, was working hard at Belvedere Vodka when she answered that cri de guerre because its sender was Ben Branson, who brought Seedlip into the world and created a whole new category of drinks. But you can catch his story in a previous episode. We are here to talk about Claire. Claire's climb from bartender to competition winner to global brand ambassador is best described as full on and nonstop. But the more time she spent in the air, the more time spent in nature became an integral part of her life. When she received that email, Claire found she was about to experience being comfortable in the uncomfortable. You know, I think it was meant to be that I had you on the show today because the first thing that President uh, Joseph Biden did was to sign the Paris Accord and the fact that nature is so important to all of us and we really need to protect it. And I know that nature is is so important to you. I, I think it, it should be so important to everyone. I don't know. It seems so obvious to say that it's important to someone because it, if there's no nature, there is no us. And I thought maybe we could start with how you fell in love with nature. Because one of the quotes that I read was one of your favorite quotes was, uh, look deep into nature, then you will understand everything by Einstein. So can we start off with that? Yeah, thank you, because it's my favorite subject to talk about. And I think it's interesting that you start with Biden's first executive order, which is to um, fix, I suppose, some of the damage that was caused over the last four years. And I think what what he has done is, is is work to mend a disconnection to nature that has enabled so many of us to other nature. And by that, I mean, if we put it in a box and we think of it, <clears throat> excuse me, as something that we can draw from or as a resource um, and is only there to serve us, then that enables us to think of it in a very different way, as opposed to thinking of ourselves as being part of nature, as opposed to being adjunct from nature, and nature is there for us to use and abuse. And so my falling back in love with nature was really connecting to it, firstly because I I became very ill I was burnt out. I was flying all around the world. I I like to think that I spent, you know, I I spent too much time in the air and not enough time with my feet on the ground, you know, my hands in the dirt. And that created um, a real separation for me from the natural world, so much so that I didn't even really realize that I needed it that badly. Because I grew up in a very urban environment, as many of us do. I grew up in Southeast London. My relationship to nature was really based on going to the park, not really going out into a forest or, you know, walking along a river. So I didn't really think that I had a connection to nature. But when I was burnt out, the most restorative thing that I found for me was to walk and then to run and then to be in nature. And and that journey, that experience for me was transformative because at first I took it to back into work because that's what I do. I wanted to make sense of the natural world through work. How can I use nature and work? So I did a lot of work with Belvedere at the time around nature and natural nurse. And then I thought actually beyond that, it's not about something, not, again, it's not about thinking about nature as something to use, but actually nature to be connected to so that we can restore and protect it and feel closer to it. And so I sort of embarked on a, a bit of a mission to help more people understand how powerful and restorative and 
brilliant nature is as a as a salve to modern life and um and so much of my research over the last decade i suppose has been on what is it what does nature do to us that's so powerful and if we understand that and if more and more of us can understand that and 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 experience the magic of it then we'll do we'll work much harder to protect and conserve and restore the damage that's been done over the last Hundred years. And how long had you been at Belvedere at that time when you felt that you needed to put your feet back on the ground? Um, I'd been at Belvedere probably eight or nine years at that point. And at that point, I was living in New York, managing the innovation team who were in Warsaw, falling in love with somebody who lived in London sort of innovating constantly as we did at Belvedere. So constantly on the road talking about the innovations that we created at Belvedere. I think I spent 80% of the time away from home. So, so that, that was, that was really difficult because up until that point, that's what I had been chasing. That's, that's what I thought I wanted my career to look like. And then when that you know, when that realization hit that I can't, I can't have what I thought I wanted. And perhaps what I wanted wasn't really what I wanted. Um, right. So I had to, I had to reset, I had to, you know, revisit what, what, what was important to me and, and yeah, create a life that was important to me. And that I could, that, that was sustainable. So I could do my job, enjoy my job, be good at my job, still be in love, still see my friends, still see my family uh, and live essentially. It's so interesting that, and ironic, that you're working with something that comes directly from nature. I mean, you're talking about a product that is made from natural ingredients. I mean, it is a food, a food product, a drink product. Mm -hmm. And that, that isn't already built in innately to that culture. or that business and that you kind of, you had not kind of, you did bring it into the business. How, how was that received when you reached out to, I guess, your bosses about bringing this in? I was very fortunate at Belvedere. I had some incredible bosses. And at that time, Charles Gibb, who's now at Fever Tree, was the president and CEO of Belvedere. And I remember many conversations that we had about nature and simplicity and the purity of our ingredients. And that was really what we needed to encourage more people to see. At the time, sort of, you know, 2008, there was a recession. And I don't know if you remember this, but there was a whole wave of synthetic hyper synthetic vodkas that hit the market so marshmallow whipped cream uh yeah. you know all of those sorts of crazy cereal flavored vodkas whatever and so we were on the opposite end of that spectrum encouraging people to think about nature um as uh, encouraging people to think about how expressive natural ingredients can actually be. You don't need to put artificial flavors or hypersynthetic flavors into your vodka if you've got really delicious, natural, fresh ingredients and and really arguing for nature as something that can give you all of those brilliant sort of deep layers layers of flavor you don't need to go to something synthetic and so and that was actually very empowering for us because it was true and authentic and that wasn't what everybody else was doing so Charles was always very supportive and actually you know Charles is a very you've met Charles he's a very transparent very honest very authentic person and that's what connected with him and with what we were doing at Belvedere. You know, we were just trying to tell the story of what we were doing in a very authentic, meaningful way. And how was it received? Really well. I mean, they're still talking about it now. That, I think, is the the hallmark of success, that there's there's now a, a brilliant, beautiful platform that, that Belvedere talks about nature. And... And they've embraced it. You know, we started talking about nature eight years ago and they've really embraced it and run with it. And and now it's, I think, part of a much more 360 approach to the environment in general. So much more. I guess 
Sorry, I guess I yeah. meant how was it received by the public? Because oh, I, see. A pu- I mean, a, a public who wants marshmallow flavored vodka may not be yes. the same public who wants a, you know, here's our grape is natural or whatever, our potato, whatever it's yeah, made yeah. out of product is natural. Did yeah. you feel people immediately embracing that, you know, line of you thinking know- and... Look, there'll always be people that want marshmallow vodka, right? And there'll always be people that want the opposite of whatever the opposite of marshmallow vodka is. And I think that, that when we started talking about our approach, there was a lot of people who who had overlooked Belvedere's approach to producing flavors and and just didn't know that that they use fresh ingredients and that there's no sugar and that you know it, it's coming from this beautiful heritage. A grain and that that will always resonate with a certain type of person who's looking for an elevated drinking experience and then you know there's always going to be people who want to sh- to shoot marshmallow flavored vodka so i think uh, provided you're you're giving people the choice and explaining you know what those choices are that are available to them and, and we were always you know super transparent about our whole process then yes there was a very positive re- reception to that and did you feel that you were becoming known as the the person who is talking about nature in <laughs> Belvedere? Uh, firstly, Susan, I became the person that was banging on about sugar. That was <laughs> my that was my first that was the first sort of like gateway into nature is is the realization that sugar is really toxic. And this is this is before sugar was you know the the, the evil. Uh, sort of gran- granulated evil that we think of it today. But at right. the time, we were like, gosh, we put a lot of sugar in our cocktails. And hey, some some people put sugar in their vodka. And oh, did you know there's sugar in ketchup and bread? So I, that was the first thing that I started to talk uh-huh. about. And yes, became known as the, oh, not, oh, not Claire again. She's here to talk to us about how much sugar we put in our tea and coffee. But then, <laughs> yes, and then then nature. And, and actually, ironically, lower ABV cocktails. And so sort of went on a bit of a mission to talk about the fact that we've got great, well-made spirits. You can have delicious lower, lower ABV cocktails with delicious ingredients. And then there, there came a point where I started to feel as though there's, there were some conflicts of interest. I was talking about wellness. I was talking about lower ABV drinking. I was talking about sugar. And at the same time, my, my role was really to promote Belvedere. And so I started to right. rub up a little, a little bit against this conflict of interest. You know, can you really encourage people to do a yoga class and then serve them cocktails? I, I, right. I started to feel a little bit uncomfortable with that. And certainly, of course, you can, ha- you can do yoga and step and have a martini if that's what you'd like. But for me, I, I felt that perhaps it was, I was, I was distracted. I was detracting from the central message of Belvedere, which is this beautiful heritage Polish spirit, and my my personal message, which, mission, which was to get more people to connect to nature and drink well and drink. I hate this expression, really, but drink mindfully and 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 to think about what they were consuming. So there was a there was just a bit of a, a mm-hmm. conflict. It's you know, um, I know you say that, but. I interviewed someone about four years ago who was a bartender in Valterans. And I said, tell me about your wellness cocktails, because there was a spa in the hotel. And he said, I have to admit that I really believe when you put alcohol in a cocktail, it ceases to be well. So it's <laughs> it's funny that you, that you say that, that you were, you know, feeling this conflict of interest. You know, of course, I'm trying to lead you to, you know, your the very, very famous story of you're getting an email saying, do you want to change the world of drinks with me? Yeah. Or I'm, I'm paraphrasing there from um, Ben Branson of Seedlip about your being the kind of go-to person to talk about nature. And that's why he sent you that email, that life-changing email. Do, do you think, I mean, that that's really why that relationship cemented? Um, you know what? I was I was interested in sugar. I was interested in nature and ingredients, and then I met Ben because we were looking to put more design, nature design, into the into the bottles of Belvedere. And then, so Ben was was working with an agency at that time, a design agency, and he came to talk to me about 
what what potentially they could do with us. And we just geeked out about nature. And he lent me a book about biomimicry. It's, it's called Biomimicry, which is, you know, looking to nature for design to, to, to innovate using nature's incredible uh, potential and and we connected over nature and so and that book actually was something that I I then you know ran with I was like oh my god there's a whole there's a whole book on this topic who knew you know it's like the intersection uh-huh. of nature and design and innovation it blew my mind um and so we we sort of bonded over nature and then when Ben started to think about Seedlip and create Seedlip I was very lucky that he he sought my counsel and asked my opinion and I tasted some early liquids. Of course I I said to him I think you're crazy. I don't I don't get it as as thousands of people have said to Ben but the great thing about Ben is he doesn't listen. Yeah. He continues. Um, and then I took Ben to Berlin to help and he presented Seedlip before Seedlip had, had even launched. I wanted to give him a platform because I you know he's a very he's a very in, inspiring person and and what I saw what he was trying to do for our industry and for people who just didn't want to drink for whatever reason was so powerful that I I was thinking I think I know the business but I could be wrong you know there's something in what he's talking about and so we we were friends we we were friends for for a few years before he sent me that email we talk about it at the time when I left there's there were like 600 brands of vodka in the US when I left uh, Belvedere and one bottle of seed lift at the time and you know if you if you're going to correct the 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 imbalance and go and do something it's it's not to go and create more vodka it's to go and you know help create more delicious non-alcoholic options so it was a kind of no-brainer for me but it was still terrifying to leave the beautiful world of of lvmh and all those incredible brands to go out and try and change the world with something non-alcoholic, which, you know, at that time, three years ago, was still terrifying. Uh, yes, I remember meeting him when he had one spirit and being like, oh, my God, what is this? This is so cool. What is this? But but because this is Lush Life, we're going to have to go backwards before we go forwards. Right. And um, we have to talk a little bit about your upbringing, even, even though I've already introduced you at the beginning, um, because... It's funny. I think we're two probably of the only little girls who actually wanted to be lawyers <laughs> when they were <laughs> whatever at nine, right? I wanted to be an entertainment lawyer. God knows where that came from, you know, um, yeah. that you saw LA Law and that was it. Um, yeah. And then you transferred to the um, hospitality industry. Um, other than it being so difficult or maybe not the passion that you felt. What was it about hospitality and the working in the bars that you really connected with that kept you there until now, really? Hmm. Well, it's a great question. And, and actually, there's so many things. I think it was the feeling, feeling welcomed feeling part of a family I'd I'd come from a family you know a a broken family and I'd always really felt like it didn't kind of fit in and here was a community of bartenders at the time just in my in in my little bar in Nottingham where we were all super passionate about drinks we didn't know anything about cocktails we taught ourselves we read all the books we made some terrible drinks I'm sure looking back but, but just lots of really passionate people who were welcoming and hardworking and fun to hang around with. I um, I, I always felt like I, I wasn't that social, but here I am, you know, running a bar and being very social and, you know, loving that life. And then what really started to draw my interest was the stories, the stories of the people that came into the bar, the stories of the bartenders I worked with, the stories of the products that we were handling. And, you know, when it's quiet, you're reading the backs of labels and wondering, oh, well, there's a story that goes with every single bottle on the back bar. And then, you know, the the alchemy of making drinks that I was suddenly very, very into, very passionate about, even though as a, as a child, I wasn't that interested in food and flavors and that sort of thing, but there was something so creative about it. It's like painting with magic, you know, you can create these 
delicious drinks and people love them and you know they fly off the menu and I don't know there was just something so immediate and so very different to my my upbringing my mum and dad don't drink so it, it was but having said that my mum and dad don't don't drink but my grandfather used to keep whiskey miniatures as a and as a child my, my brother and I used to sit in the spare bedroom where he kept lots of the other kind of crazy miniatures and we would <laughs> empty them out and mix them up and <laughs> fill them back up with tea or water <laughs> so my poor granddad used to like think that he had tons of miniatures but they were full of tea so so that was our only really experience that of, is like, so funny liquor I know. And, and so, yeah, I just fell in love with the, I just fell in love with the life. I fell in love with the lifestyle of it and, um, and wanted more. And so the only way that I felt I could really learn was to compete and enter cocktail competitions at the time. That was the only way that you could learn and progress. And again, you know, entering competitions was, was brilliant because people were so supportive and you might enter something dreadful. My first cocktail wasn't even tasted by the judges <laughs> it was so bad <laughs> um, but still you were you were welcomed and and people wanted to teach you things and so that's that's what really drew me in I think you know it's funny while you're speaking what before you said this word I was wondering about um the creativity in your life beforehand and why that might have been one of the reasons why you loved making the cocktails had you done to um any creative arts when you were younger or had was this the first time that you were able to be creative or felt that you were being creative I am very creative and I'm I was brilliant at art at school and I was brilliant at English I should have pursued that sort of avenue I suppose but according to I don't know people that didn't really matter that wasn't a that wasn't a noble path to take to do something that was creative for creative sake. You know, I often say to my husband, one day I'll write a book and, you know, I do like doodle in my spare time. And, you know, I am, I am, I have, I need that outlet. And I think, yes, getting into this world does unlock a hell of a hell of a lot of creativity from making drinks and then, you know, into marketing and thinking about, how to bring your brand to life and activations. I mean, there's so much creativity in this business and that's so yeah, creating a story, creating exactly. a story about a, uh, a cocktail, creating a cocktail. Yeah. These are creative arts, uh, yes. you know, in my opinion, definitely. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny that you mix that with the, the competitive nature of trying to succeed, you know, as a lawyer, as that, you know, that, that, you know, the, the legal studies of wanting also to compete and not being afraid to compete, even after they didn't want to even drink your first drink. Okay. You know, the first no, cocktail Susan, you I made. wrote a letter. I wrote a letter to complain. What, that they didn't drink it? <laughs> yes. Oh. Yes. And guess who, and guess who the letter of complaint went to? Moet Hennessy. Oh, no way. So in my first yeah. interview with Moet Hennessy, Years later for Belvedere, they pulled that letter out. Oh, no way. They kept and it. They kept it and read it to me. <laughs> and, and you got, but you got the job. I got the job. You got but the I met, job. I was, I was mortified. <gasps> I was mortified. But I was like, look, that's how passionate I was. <laughs> that's how much I wanted to kind of, I was wanted to be included in the cocktail competition. And I mean, it, we laugh about it now. It was, it was so, it was mortifying at the time, but. But yeah, I mean, look, there's so much, there's so much good stuff in this, in this business. And um, I think another sort of part of, of what I, what I want to do with any platform that I have is to encourage people to consider joining our brilliant industry as a, as a really exciting, dynamic career path. I've, my husband said, will say the same that, you know, we've, we've had nothing but love and respect for what this industry have given us um, and all of the opportunities. And I think that's because it's such a creative industry. We're constantly reinventing, learning, trying new things. And that's, that's appealing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when, you know, you start, you started as a bartender during your studies, when did you, was there a time, should I say, when you thought 
this is going to be my career. Was that the job um, at Belvedere or was before? I think it was maybe a year into my job at Belvedere because I remember signing my contract and the HR manager saying, in, in a year you get X, Y, Z benefits. And I thought, I might not be here in a year. This is this is a bit too grown up for me. But then a year from then, I thought, oh, yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> they kept me around. And then I, then I sort of set my sights on wanting to be the best, the best ambassador I could be, then the best European ambassador. And then I thought, I wonder if I could maybe be the best global ambassador that I could be. And once I reached that level of, of the global ambassador, I thought, oh, I don't know what I don't know where to go now. I don't know what I want to do now. It, it happened relatively quickly, so I was I was always grateful for the opportunities. I was always thinking that I was, it, they were going to be taken away from me. That um, you know, still battle with imposter syndrome. I always felt that th this is too good to be true. So so I think a year I was like, this is going to be my career, and I'm going to work really bloody hard because I don't want it to be taken away. And so I'll just do the best job I possibly can. And now we're going to come to another quote. Sorry. And I'm looking with my glasses. It's not that, because it's not that letter, is it? No. You're not pulling no, from no, that letter. No, no, it's not the letter. <laughs> and it is Ben Branson who's saying, get comfortable the uncomfortable. Mm. So 12 years, Belvedere, so comfy. As you said, you got all those benefits. You got holiday. You knew that Belvedere, if you didn't come into work that day, Belvedere was going to still be there. Yeah. Right. It existed already. You didn't yes. have to create anything. It existed. <laughs> yeah. So you jump off into this huge unknown into the world of seed lip. Had you even discussed creating another whole series of products when you answered that email? Or I mean, did uh, Ben have an idea or was it really jumping into an abyss? No, no, Ben Ben had a very clear idea of what he wanted to create. And fortunately, I agree. I agreed. It was always going to be something that wasn't Seedlip. It was always going to be a new brand. And I underestimated how difficult it, it was going to be. I think if I'd known how difficult, I would have perhaps said maybe ask somebody who, I don't know maybe ask somebody somebody else not that I regret anything at all because it's been such an amazing experience but I think I would have been too too frightened I, I think I would have simply thought I'm not cut out for that I can't do that I don't know how to do that and that's a lesson right just because you don't know how to do something it isn't an isn't a good enough excuse to not give it a go Oh, and so I also, I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt you because I think you're being modest because <laughs> you were on the path to, you know, or should I say an easy career path of becoming a lawyer when you jumped in to avoid of the total unknown, you know, except for playing with your grandfather's, you know, miniatures. Yeah. And, and that takes a lot of guts. Because I know my parents still ask me to this day, are you sure you don't want to go to law school? And I'm like, uh, no, I think that that ship has passed. So I totally understand. You know, I totally can see why you are the perfect person. So let's oh, get that thanks. modesty out of the way. <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, my dad, by the way, still says to me, when are you going back to law school? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, 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 uh, I, so I, so, so we, we knew what we wanted to create, but there was no roadmap for that. And whatever we were going to create was not going to be seed lip. And so therefore, everything that Ben had learned about seed lip, some of it was relevant. But in terms of simply produce or creating a new new type of liquid, and in our case, three different types of liquids, mm -hmm. that was all that was all unknown. And also, I think a lot of I think less so now but certainly then we we we're so lucky with alcohol and how alcohol is a brilliant way to extract flavor and to keep things set stable and to give 
depth the flavor and complexity you know take a lot of it for granted and I needed to unlearn so much of what I'd learned at Belvedere in order to embark on creating something like Acorn because there were there wasn't you know there wasn't the the alcohol there to 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 work with and and so we just started from scratch and I wouldn't have it any other way, actually. There was lots of, we used to say it's like a game of snakes and ladders, lots of like highs, many, many lows, uh, lots of people laughing at us, lots of people saying you're crazy, lots of people saying no. Um, And we just kept going. And, you know. I I can never, I never understand that when people say no, because it makes you want to work harder. Now, um, when, did you have an idea of doing three, three, um, expressions to start off with or were you just going to start with one and then go on no we wanted to do three expressions good things come in threes and we were inspired by one particular recipe that I'm sure you you know I've mentioned before which is a recipe for acorn wine which is hidden in the back of the art of distillation which is where Ben got his inspiration for seed lip that recipe read very much like a recipe for vermouth and that chimed with us because we wanted to create something that uh, would be complementary to seed lip, would enable bartenders to make a whole range of classic style non-alcoholic cocktails. And vermouth at that time was very, very popular. It still is. And then we also wanted to create something that was inspired by Italian Amari. So something very bitter and bold. And, and acorns give you such a lot of flavor and bitterness and we knew that we could take acorns from being lightly bitter all the way through to being very very bitter that we have in acorn bitter and so there's a whole sort of gamut of of flavors that we could that we could access and then really working with beautiful ingredients botanical ingredients in the same way that you would with amari or vermouth and then the, the most challenging part I think of creating acorn was trying to find the right base so we use English sparkling wine grapes Ben was very 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 keen on using verjou um, and there is no verjou produced or there's there's no green harvest that's that that happens in the UK and, and for people who don't know what a green harvest is I'll quickly explain grapes that are grown for wine production typically have their vines trimmed sort of September time and the grapes that are left on the vine have much less competition so that the sunlight can ripen that grape and the grapes that are removed early on in the season so September typically are thrown to the floor or if there's lots of them they are pressed and verju is the resulting li- liquid so green mm-hmm. juice but you need a lot of grapes and you need a lot, lot of waste grapes for people for producers to to bother pressing them and in this country while we have brilliant wine we don't have a lot of grapes still so every single grape is used in wine production mm-hmm. and that's why some people laughed and some people said we were crazy because there's no green harvest here and in fact some wine producers in this country didn't know what a green harvest was even so Mm. so we were really struggling to find somebody to work with we went speaking to wine producers in california and in france and you know we really didn't want to transport verju across seas and then eventually we found a brilliant partner and a grower in sussex who has really been such a wonder a delight to work with because he only grows English sparkling wines for Verjou production so we get a lot of really great control over the quality of that liquid so we can balance sweetness and acidity and that for me is is that plus our technical know-how and our uh, blending ability is the reason why Acorn I think is like nothing else because you've got this wonderful base these brilliant ingredients that are all so complementary to one another and it's delicious and stable and all the boring things that people don't really want to know about. But, but 
it's that beautiful relationship that we have with our grower in Sussex and then the ingredients that we pick and of course the acorns so and how long did it though. take you to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, are we talking years to find the exact flavor combinations that you wanted exactly? So I joined in January 2018, and it probably took us about a year. Then the hardest thing was getting someone to help us make, you know, produce it. So at scale. So so that that was another six months or so. Wait, wait, wait a sec about the flavor. Hold on. Now, you're two people, so you have two opinions. And I'm sure there are a lot of other people. Was it was it difficult to um, to both agree on what you thought was the right flavor? No, no, ah. no. Ben's got a great palate. And um, when we were creating, so Acorn Dry is my my personal favorite. That was my baby. And acorn aromatic, Ben was, gave me a sort of like a, a flavor profile that he was really wanted to create. So that was his baby. And that was the one that he, he led on. Uh, and then acorn bitter needed to kind of tick a lot of flavor profile boxes for us. And so we, we agreed on, on, on that one. But, but no, I mean, he, he, he's got a great palette and, uh, I don't think we had any disagreements about that to be honest well that's good now now you were saying yeah. that you it was going to be difficult to find someone to bottle it yeah that, that was a, that was a, yeah yeah that was another tough thing again this is the this is what a lot of people don't don't, don't perhaps think about with with non-alk is that this is all still so new it's you know seedlip is five years old acorn is two this whole industry is still nascent and the the production technology and know-how is still is still very new. So, so yeah, a couple of years ago, we were still we were struggling to find someone who would who would work with us to produce this crazy new liquid. That's crazy to me because Seedlip had already been on the market. So you would think that that process, once you had the recipes and all that, the flavors and decided all that, that the next part would be easy because Ben had already you know fought that war. Yeah, that's so surprising yeah, but, to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, seed lip and acorn very, very different liquids, though, um, and so need a entirely new production process. So yeah, it, we had to start from scratch. Oh. So how long was it from the flavor to the bottle and on the shelf? I remember it clearly because it was over Christmas time that we found a partner to work with us, and then it was on shelf in May. 2019 and it went on shelf we we launched in selfridges and as the same the same way as seed lip did mm -hmm. and that was very exciting and then the other really ex such such an exciting endorsement of what we had created was when we sat with the main buyer of waitrose the the beers wines and spirits buyer at waitrose who is italian and it italy's first master of wine and you know if anyone's going to tell you about amari and you know the peritivo style products it's going to be this person and, and be blunt about it and be so blunt about yeah. it it might have even been it could i think it might have even been ben and i's first meeting with a retailer and it was terrifying and he loved it and he he said we've written it down i think we should get it tattooed on ourselves but he said these liquids are beguiling and gorgeous and honestly i think i i, I passed out maybe blacked out for a bit i was so <laughs> relieved that somebody somebody like him could could say that and love them and um yeah and that that was and say was it just, in the know, most the first romantic of, like, way many great yes yes it's so romantic of course, of course. yeah yeah, I yeah. <laughs> just like a true Italian. Um, so Italian, but yeah. but you know, you we work you work on these things in a in a bubble, and you think they're good, and then someone else who has this incredible palette in, says the same thing in a much more romantic way than I could have put it. But but yeah, what a great endorsement, and that gave us, I think, or at least gave me some additional kind of confidence um, around sharing what we've created with with everybody else, which is always terrifying. 
Yes, you said the word confidence. Um, do you feel that um, having had this experience and gone through it, uh, this is such an obvious question probably, that you've learned a lot about yourself and um, the industry in a different way? Mm. Yes, I have learned a hell of a lot about myself and our industry because I think at Belvedere there was a lot of there was a lot that came with that role and that brand that opened a lot of doors for me and when you leave all of that behind a lot of those you know I've still kept all of the wonderful relationships that I have with with many brilliant people in our industry but you have to start again and you have to start having these conversations again and it's quite humbling actually to to have all of that great luxury life taken away, stripped back. And actually what you're talking about is much more me. It's much more about what I've created as opposed to the legacy of being the, the brand custodian for, for a heritage brand. But it was about coming back to what I've done. And I, I hope you like this. It's That was what was terrifying. And so you have three wonderful no ABV spirits on the shelf. Are you starting to create new things now? So we're only two, so we're still uh, still getting going. But we we did create the No Grony that came out of the Acorn and Seedlip portfolio. Mm. So Ben's first cocktail that he created for Seedlip was the No Grony. I think it's maybe one of the most famous non-alcoholic cocktails in the world now. And that drink before Acorn came along, took a few days to to make hundreds of ingredients, a brilliant drink, but just, you know, not not scalable. And so when we were creating Acorn, that was in the back of our minds that this portfolio should be able to provide uh, us with the ingredients to produce the Negroni and for bars and bartenders and even and people at home to make the Negroni at home. And so we bottled the Negroni and that has been so, so popular. And it is a brilliant, brilliant bottled expression of our favorite non out cocktail. So now that you have the Negroni, you have your three expressions. What do you think is going to be your next challenge? <laughs> getting, getting Acorn out of the UK and into other new exciting markets, that's the next that's the next highlight for us. That's what we're most excited about. We missed summer when we launched Acorn. We launched in May, so we just missed the summer. Then, of course, last year, let's not go into why there was no summer last year. This year will be our first summer where we can really celebrate the spritz and hopefully, 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 fingers crossed, get back into the real world, into bars, restaurants and bring the brand to life in a very different way than we have over the last year. So that's the next challenge. So it's kind of like you've gone full circle now. You are going to be your global brand ambassador again for these, your three new babies. Hopefully with less air miles. <laughs> yeah, yeah less, with less air miles, um, I hope. No, and with not, lots of nature in your life as opposed to the last time. Yes. Yes, exactly. And that's that's what everybody I hope also comes back to that is always there for us to to be restored by. But I think I've got a much better understanding of my limits and my boundaries now when it comes to that sort of life. And look, you know, we've proven for the last 12 months that we can we can do a lot of great work in this way. So so perhaps we'll all travel a little less and appreciate it more once we get back on planes. Absolutely. And considering we're all home, I think that's a great lead into um, some advice that you might give uh, our home bartenders who are listening. Um, what would be your top tips for them? So my tips vary at the moment I mean I would always say find the best ingredients you can and you know most local ingredients things that are in season things that are going to give you as much flavor as they possibly can naturally so thinking about buying 
fruits and berries and all those sorts of things when they're in season or even foraging for berries. Uh, it's a great time, not now, not, there's not much around now, but uh, the end, autumn time is a great time to be hunting for berries and that sort of those sorts of things. I would say cocktail bitters are a brilliant way of acting like a seasoning for cocktails. And I always find that when something's slightly missing for me, a splash of bitters can really help to elevate a cocktail to a whole nother level. So, so yes, that would be my other tip. And then also lovely glassware, you know, really beautiful glassware that you can find in charity shops. And I like mismatched glassware. I don't like to keep things too too neat and tidy. So, so they would be my kind of like three top tips. And of course, acorn in your drinks cabinet is my other recommendation. Of course, that goes without saying. But in terms of cocktail makers who are making non-alcoholic drinks, maybe for their guests who don't want to have it, what should they be thinking? Is it something different or should they just be thinking, oh, I'm just going to take out the alcoholic and replace it with the non-alcoholic? Firstly, great that they're thinking of the person who's not drinking because that's that's the first reminder that not everybody wants to drink alcohol at a party or a dinner party. So that's that's kudos of people who actually consider those who aren't drinking. I think it's tough to just switch out classic alcoholic cocktails for non-alc options because there's always going to be the expectation that this is going to taste like the alcoholic equivalent. And, and invariably it doesn't and it, and it can't by dint of the fact that alcohol is a very unique liquid and does lots of things to our body f- physiologic, physiologically. So I would say that the best approach to making great non-alcoholic cocktails is to think of texture, of complexity, of ensuring that that drink is cold. I know we mentioned that ice is always a factor, but but for non-alcoholic cocktails, ice is not necessarily such an important factor because you're not looking for additional dilution because you're not diluting alcohol. So it's important that you start with cold ingredients rather than using ice to di- to further dilute because oh. that's not necessary. And so I always approach my before acorn before seed lip you know thinking about acidity what type of acidity can you use not just lemons there's vinegars there's fermented ingredients thinking about texture should it be carbonated could it be something that's infused you know tea also great provides brilliant textural, provides texture in, in non-out cocktails, tannins as well tea is great for that too so so thinking about what ingredients you can use to to actually feel something in the in the mouth and then in terms of flavors anything from being super subtle as i mentioned to to tea through to you know great big bold flavors things like smoke things like anything that's slightly aged things that are spicy all of those will will give you you know a, a whole gamut of ingredients and or ideas to play with when it comes to to making something non-alcoholic but really be thinking about acidity salinity age you know weight and all the ingredients that that could potentially provide that as opposed to just switching out an out cocktail for a non-alc equivalent i sometimes feel that 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 doesn't quite work you have to kind of consider that there's no alcohol at play that is fabulous thank you so much that's really great advice now i always leave with asking if you could be drinking anywhere in the world right now anything what would that be oh and where and where would it be the choices are endless i know um i i'm missing the pub frankly i'm gonna get on to where i'll be drinking cocktails in a sec but there's something so integral to my life we go for a dog walk we go to the pub we walk home life's good so the pub I'm missing and that that I'm sure is a, a hole in many, many people's lives right now. In terms of cocktails and all that sort of good stuff, I think I'd be, I, I, I miss drinking martinis in New York, probably oh. somewhere like employees only. There's a whole list of bars. People, I hope people aren't upset with me if I forget uh, drinking, yeah, just drinking martinis somewhere 
somewhere like employees only would be great. Just, yeah, to be honest, anywhere, we, we've missed so many great opportunities to see friends um, and drink cocktails with them. You know, we're so lucky in this business where we get to travel and visit people in their bars and and, and enjoy a cocktail with them. So, you know, I'm missing New Orleans for Tales of the Cocktail. I'm missing Berlin for Berlin Bar Show. I'm missing, you know, going to various towns, cities all over this country and seeing friends who, who have brilliant bars, which... I really hope to get back to once once things start to get back to normal. We will. We definitely will. Well, let me thank you so much. This has been so amazing to have you on Lush Life. And thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Susan. Thanks so much to Claire for joining me on Lush Life. Don't miss her podcast, The Spritzing Hour, where she gets to the bitter truth and hears from the rule breakers and game changers who are leading the charge turning the table on traditional food and drink culture, and reshaping our social lives for the better. But before tuning in, I highly suggest making our Cocktail of the Week. Clementines are still in season, so grab those wintry delights and let's make our Cocktail of the Week. Today, we're making the Acorn Clementine Spritz. So, add 50 mils of acorn bitter to a wine glass or a tall glass filled with ice. Then add the juice of half a clementine. Stir gently. Then top that all up with Fever Tree Blood Orange Soda. Give it another gentle stir. And then garnish with a clementine wheel or clementine leaves. Now you've mastered this cocktail, it's time to try the famous Negroni and the Cosno. You'll find these recipes, more alcohol-free cocktails, and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com, where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. I love that vodka is listed under miscellaneous spirits, after Southern Comfort and Aquavit, and before tequila and absinthe. He remarks that as of 1948, there is no Russian vodka available in the USA. But there is Smirnoff. And you can find vodka available in green, yellow, and pink colors. Just in case you were wondering. So if you live for Lush Life, make sure you're giving back to the bars or restaurants you love by donating or taking part in cocktail or food delivery where you live. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly and wash your hands and wear a mask. Next time on Lush Life, we meet the man behind the modern bar cart. Not the drinks trolley, but another podcaster with a great drinks podcast. Until that time, bottoms up. Bottoms up.